Have you ever felt like you're all alone in the world, feeling disconnected, detached, not really understanding why you can't seem to stay connected? You're not alone. This is one of the biggest challenges I think we have in our society today is really being able to form and maintain true human connections. You know, one of the things that you hear people talk a lot about out there right now is this loneliness epidemic, because there are a lot of people who are engaged to a certain level, but still detached and disconnected. And I think a lot of that has to do with some of our social skills that maybe we've kind of lost over the generations, as well as, unfortunately, things like social media really occupying a lot of our time mm -hmm. and not allowing us to have that true human interaction where we actually have to use words and verbalize and, 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 and be face to face versus send an emoji, you know, express your emotion with verbal words versus this emoji. Cause I'm sad. If that, if that makes sense to you. So I really think it's a skill of what we've lost and how we stay connected with people. I think recognizing that for many organizations and for many companies, many families, everyone's going through the motions instead of taking a step to be concerned about creating those relationships. I think there once was a time when we really did focus a lot of time on building a relationship, getting to know the other people, getting to know what their talents were, what their interests were, um, how we can contribute to helping them further their goals and vice versa. Whereas now, I think oftentimes we just get into the rut of just doing day by day, going through the checklist and not taking that time to connect. And that goes just all around in organizations and in the organization of a family as well. Yeah, you know, as soon as you mentioned family, because I think that's a big piece of it, too. And, and both parts of that are important to uh, stability and balance in your life, uh, you, your work life and, and how much time, because we obviously spend a great amount of our lives engaged with that work family, if you want to call it that. But then you also have your bloodline at home and, and having that balance too and, and, and being disconnected uh, is, a, is a very interesting thing that we go through. Sean, from your perspective, and I know in a lot of the work you do with the mental health community, is this something that you're seeing as a trend? Would you call it an epidemic or something more or something less than that? I think it's maybe more than that. I think what we have to understand, Brian, is that we live in a divide and conquer society and that's leading heavily to the disconnect that everyone's feeling. Um, we focus more on entertainment um, and loose connections, one night stands, um, instant gratification type things. But um, the connections that we truly need um, that help us evolve as a, as a species even are those deep connections, not the superficial ones that were marketed to uh, via uh, television programming um, that we all fall victim to. I um, mean, it, it is quite a quite an epidemic. If you look at school age children uh, right now, um, depression and anxiety are, is at an all time high where, where kids are taking, you know, mental health days in middle school, in high school, you know, and that is indicative of a very sick society that we have right now. And we're, we're not getting those, um, those relationships that we need. Um, and all of that boils down to the depression, the anxiety is your, your ego, your mind craving, mm -hmm. craving more, craving deeper relationship um, with the people around you. You know, we, we all work in different, uh, different settings and we all are familiar with the term work husband or work wife and these types of things and don't really get the, the understanding that what you're saying is you've been split mm -hmm. so far in half that you have a whole spouse, spousal relationship set up in your workplace. That should, that's off balance. You know, we, sh we shouldn't be that focus on other things outside of ourselves, outside of our family units that we've established these, these firm um, walls and lines around ourselves. Uh, to, and we just really, you know, block ourselves in and prevent us from having those relationships. If you have a work husband, a work wife at home, how's your work, your, your wife, wife feeling at home? <laughs> Most people that have yeah. that situation 
have a pretty yeah. abysmal situation at home and they find solace in, in that work wife when it should be the other way around. Um, but we really need to focus more on, you know, learning ourselves and learning, you know, the depth that we have in ourselves. Then we can know how to find the depth in others. And that's how we build those deeper bonds and deeper relationships that we so crave, you know, as a society. Yeah, well, no, very well said. So let me ask this question, Sean. Is, would you say, based on the work you've seen and, and the experiences you've had with the, the different people in your communities that you're, you're seeing this happen, where do you think the disconnect is happening? Is it something that we can start? And is it family first? So at home, is it the educational system? Is it a combination of that? Is it, is it just society? Is it social media? What are your thoughts as to what we can start to do to right this ship? Because as you said, when you were in middle school already and you started to have mm -hmm. to take mental health days, that's not going to bode well as we move forward. So what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Brian, the, that's a great question. But the, the first relationship that we have to um, really guard and intend to is the one with self. OK, that, that's the number one. And then the number one deal breaker there is this guy right here. We have this, you know, separating ourselves from ourselves when we're with ourselves. No one is sitting down in, in silence in, in periods of meditation. Just walk by yourself. No, you're walking, you know, with your cell phone. You never, you know, build that relationship with yourself first. Mm -hmm. And it extends from there. Then it goes to family, then to community, then to neighborhood, society, out from there. So we have that ripple effect, but it's starting right here with losing our our, our 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 tether you know to ourselves and if we're going to you know change that we have to start with self-love and self-actualization of skills first because it has to start here you know the saying you can't pour from an empty glass and if you started um as a toddler as a grade school kid you know on the tablet on the ipad into social media you never got you know, the chance to learn yourself and learn the things you like. I know the things that I like and some of the things that I enjoy because as a child, I didn't have a plethora of toys and things. Me and my siblings, we learned how to play. And when you don't have things, you have to use your imagination and your imagination is the one that shows you the things that you like. Oh, you kind of like building. Well, I had tiles to play with from my um, my mom's, you know, mm -hmm. tile um, set that they had for, to see if we're gonna put tiles in the bathroom and in the house. That became a toy and you you just build from there. So I learned I like being creative. I learned I like colors. I learned I like to do things with my hands. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't have that time to learn yourself, learn what you like, learn how you move, you're starting off from a very, very slippery slope that, you know, what we're seeing now is trending in the wrong direction. But we have to start with rebuilding and bolstering our love for self and our self-identification. Stop identifying ourselves with others. Don't identify with your sibling. Don't identify with your parents, with your friend group, with whatever that may be. So it's just going to blossom out from there. But we have to get down to the, the nexus of yourself, you know, connecting self to self, finding there, and then being able, then we can start doing the, the necessary work of adding to that. But zero plus zero is still zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're getting our self-worth mm -hmm. from the wrong places, right? Mm -hmm. And needing to be validated, I think, from mm -hmm. the wrong places. And so what ends up happening is it becomes very shallow and very superficial versus having that depth that it really should have. Mm -hmm. So when something doesn't go our way, it, it really hurts, right? Because we, we haven't built that thick skin that I think you, you do develop when you have those more interpersonal relationships when you're younger. Uh, and, and unfortunately, what tends to happen for a lot of people when that hurt happens, they withdraw even further, right? Which then just compounds the issue. And, and that's some of the things that I see. When we were all children, we did a lot of play. So we really did have a lot of mental health days or at least the mental health hours every day because we got to take some time out to actually play as children outdoors and just, you know, whether it's riding bikes, um, just playing in the front yard. We actually had a lot of time to play and we didn't have a lot of the worries of adults pushed on us. I think a lot of children nowadays have adult concerns, things that they're concerned about that really aren't a children's business. And that's a, a part of um, 
where we adults could do better uh, in, in mm-hmm. general. A lot of children are carrying adult worries, adult concerns, and it plays into it um, from whether they're hungry or whether they're overhearing their parents having um, adult conversations. But it, it's very hard for many children, um, mm-hmm. at least in, in our country. I can't talk about experiences you know, from children other places. But in the United States, a lot of uh, being a child has changed, at least the concept of what a child hears, what a child does, what a, it's hard. I think it's harder now to be a child than when we were young people. Um, and as far as their self-worth, well, they're watching how we all react to things and they're catching um, their clues from social media. They're catching their clues from television. They're catching their clues from media about what um, a, a desirable or a successful person is. And it's not uh, necessarily positive things. It's really um, media is feeding our children what they want our children to believe they are. And it's not in our children's best interest. Their clothes, clothes, their language, the food that they're eating. It's not it's not in our children's best interest. What it's doing is really feeding our children the idea of becoming what um, different companies want them to be so that they can be uh, bigger consumers of their products and services. I think that's a that's a good point, Erica. Um, And you can tell, you know, the baggage that the children are wearing are carrying from the clothing they are wearing. Yeah. I, I, I think we, we, we don't catch that, that, uh, that connection there. You know, if you're a child and you're in your imaginative state, you, you see them, right? They're the kids that have on the converse with the tutu, um, with the rain, everything mismatched. They're living as a child. You look next door and you see this child, the same age that has, you know, it has extensions and nails and and right. clothing that's a little bit more provocative. And right. what comes with that? Adult baggage comes with those adult clothes that yeah. they are not ready to mm-hmm. attend to. And mm-hmm. they're already socially farther than they are develop, developmentally. Um, right. And that that's a, a high concern. Uh, if you matter of fact, if you ask any any teacher, you know, and I know you see it in in your space, but that's a concern. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's so many predators out there. So if the children are already dressed like that, then it kind of you have to ask, what's the mindset of the parents that let them leave that way? I remember when yeah. my daughter had, um, you know, how your little girls have the little dress up kits that you can get from, you know, whether it, back in the day it could have been Toys R Us, now Walmart or Amazon or dress up kits. Well, my daughter had a little, she might've been like three or four. She had like a little princess outfit and it had these cute little miniature um, little heels. And so she put on her little princess outfit. She had her little clunk. And we were just around the house and, um, you know, her father saw them. He's like, take those off. <laughs> I'm like, what? Like we're at the house. She's playing print, you know, whatever Disney princess it was. But, you know, I had to take them off and, you know, I don't know if I threw them in the garage, but anyway, she never saw those shoes again. So it really does. It really leads us to um, think, you know, as parents, we really have to have take responsibility for that ourselves. And mind you, this was my daughter just playing dress up in the house, but not out in public. But nowadays, kids go out in public and, like you said, have a whole grown up, you know, uh, attire when they go out and not just playing makeup, you know watching their moms and playing in their mom's um, bathroom cabinets with some makeup, but actually just going out, you know, very young, six, seven, eight years old um, and just total club attire. Well, dad, dad knew that eventually society was going to let her know what heels mean. Just yeah. like if, if, if anybody is um, Pentecostal yeah. or apostolic mm-hmm. in, in the, in the arena, know that you don't wear heels to church for those very same reasons so you know it it's only a matter of time before it's oh i'm just being princess elsa mm-hmm. till oh i'm glorilla or, right, or right. whoever because social media is going to make that connection for them very quick mm-hmm. uh, and you see it 
uh, you see that that change in, in this, you see it quickly in the stature. You know, they'll go from, you know, childhood playing to, oh. Yeah. Because they've made the mental connection to like, oh no, heels mean something. Just like my mother was like, no lipstick, right? Mm -hmm. No lipstick and nails because you knew that that means something. Red lipstick, oh no. (laughs) Those are fighting words because those mean something society and it doesn't matter what the age is. Those things carry societal weight with them Mm -hmm. that they're not ready to handle. Even in the 80s, a lot of people still didn't get to wear lipstick at all until, you know, maybe 11th grade, 12th grade. And people might laugh at it now, but it was, and that's the ones that were allowed to wear it, you know, until they were like 16, 17 years old. And a lot of people still weren't until they went to college. Kids might laugh at it now, but, you know, a lot of people didn't wear anything more than a, a neutral color or lip gloss. But I want to go back to talking about a little bit of um, self-worth and, and social media from the standpoint of, you know, well, my, my, my post didn't get enough likes, so now my feelings are hurt. And, and a lot of that really is what, what drives a lot of what people choose to do, the younger people day to day, you know, is they're really looking at that as a metric of, of their value. But what I want to carry on with that is as a parent, I want to hear your perspectives on what age is too young to have one of those phones given to you as a child? I think it's okay for a child to have a dumb phone simply because as a parent, if you have a child in a practice, you may not always want to pop out and go, you know, have to search for them or you might want your child to have a phone for an emergency. So mm-hmm. I think a dumb phone is fine at a younger age. Um, it just depends on the parent and, you know, what they feel is best. But at least with a dumb phone, you can control it more. Um, as far as a smartphone, uh, probably 14 and up. And that, that might be a little old to some people, but I would say 14 and up. And even then, you have to make sure you have a lot of the controls on the phone. Sean, what are your thoughts on that? I don't think it's an age thing, Brian. My feeling is that it's a maturity thing okay. um, and it's a parent, a parental maturity as well. You have to be able to assess your child and understand where they are um, and yeah. and understand. And you have to understand what, what the issue is. A lot of parents let their children have phones and all these things early on because they don't really grasp, even though you're seeing um, um, scientists say all the time right now, this is the worst thing that your child can have. And the parents that don't let their children have them are looked at as outcasts or somehow, you know, have moved back into the stone ages. But we have to understand neuroscience is neuroscience. Mm-hmm. They're telling you that we're lighting up the wrong parts of the brain mm-hmm. at the wrong times and creating a cycle that is going to be very hard to break. It's basically getting them hooked on cigarettes mm-hmm. and at three years old. It's an addiction. Mm-hmm. So we have to understand as a parent when to interject. And and I'm talking from experience because my soon to be four year old had got a uh, tablet, you know, for his second birthday, I believe, or or, or soon thereafter, you know, long car rides. And it's it's just easy for parents. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I started to see how his behavior was changing. Um, Things he would say, his mannerisms were changing and that was disturbing enough, but the most disturbing thing was his ability to focus because mm-hmm. there's swipe, 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 yeah. instant, instant gratification, things popping in and out. And so when you're saying, Hey, it's time to go do this and that can, yeah. can, can focus. So I can said, that, Nope, that's got to go. And you know, we, he hasn't had that thing in a month and, mm-hmm. and, and hasn't asked for it. He asked for it twice, nice. you know, but kids are that resilient. So that's one thing we have to understand too. And we also have to understand that those devices, we've all watched a good Bruce Willis movie or action pack movie. These guys are using smartphones to signal drones, you know, like Mm -hmm. what kind of spy are you at three years old that you need this, this device? Because that's what this is. Mm -hmm. A smartphone is a computer in your, in your hand that can, Mm -hmm move the world and people do this is the same device that elon musk uses 
right? It's the same thing. Now, what business does a three-year-old have with that same technology? Because it is that, the same technology. You know, if we think back to computers back in the day when they were first built, that built a room, you would not put your child in there and say, go have fun <laughs> with, that, with that mainframe computer that filled the whole room, right? But now that it's this small, you're like, oh, it's just a toy now. No, it's the same, matter of fact, 1,000 times higher computing power that they have in their hand now. Mm -hmm. And because it's now attract, it's attached to their brain, it becomes a very dangerous tool. So I would like to see that move and normalize back to, um, you know, middle school, high school, where, you, where you, your kids are on a, on a leash, you know. Mm -hmm. When they're right there next to you, they don't need to be on the tablet or on the, on the phone right what you know all the way up until they're gone to erica's point you know when you're off you know at sports you're at practice you're away from mom and dad you know we might need those types of things but to you utilize those as the main means of entertainment and activity for your child that that's 100 percent the wrong answer and it's leading our children in the wrong uh direction and that's what we're seeing right now we have to pull back as parents, you know, find ourselves, start parenting again and get down on the floor and play with your child. Find out. I want to know if my, what my child's imagination looks like. So I get down and play. Oh, is Chase on the mountain up there? Yes. Oh, that's really cool. I can do that or watch him watch kids unboxing toys and watching kids play with toys. And then now he's just mimicking behavior instead of installing the behavior himself and those are two totally different actions two totally different brain functions to mimic somebody and for you to organically invent this thing in your head and that's what we're missing and so when it's time to start inventing from your own brain and all you've been doing is watching someone else invent from their brain you know it's not the same the difference between writing something down and texting something the phone is making that letter A. You're not writing the letter A, right? If you look at the research about how the QWERTY keyboard has changed society, I'd suggest you look at it because the evidence is really interesting. Of Kids can't even write anymore yeah. because you assume that they can write because in preschool they learn how to form letters, mm -hmm. but they stopped doing that a long time ago, and now they're just typing everything. And so penmanship isn't even a thing anymore, right? So we've got to get back to the basics, uh, encouraging play, uh, self-awareness, and, and self-thought at, at an early age, and engaging them in their, um, in their free play to understand where their mental faculties is. That's how you find out what your child is into, um, what their passions are, what drives them, what motivates them by watching how they play. If I hear them saying something that is rude or or off base, hey, 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 what, what, what was that? Because that didn't come from you. That came from your engagement with somebody else. And we don't talk like that in this house. Mm -hmm. You heard that on YouTube. We don't say those things here. We don't have that kind of sass in this house because manners mean something to me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've got to get back to parenting away from electronics and we need to do the same thing for ourselves. And what we do now, as we get older, we say, oh, I got to put that cell phone down and all this next. We realize how, you know, damaging it is for ourselves. Yeah. So just imagine, you know, what it's doing for our child. And we can be the bad parent and say, hey, no, not not for my child. You know, mm -hmm. as for me in my house, <laughs> we're going to stay away from the iPad. Yeah. No, I agree. Sometimes I do. I, too, have to turn off my phone. Yeah. I have to turn yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, there's a, a, a TV show that's on. It's Carrie Washington's in it. And basically, it's about her father who's been incarcerated for most of her life. And he's just gotten out after this 17 year stint. And it's so amazing because, you know, he sees her on her phone, right? Because, you know, and he's like, can't you just put that thing down? And she's like, Dad, nobody can put these things down, <laughs> right? And they're in like a coffee shop. So he looks around. Cause he hasn't experienced it. He's been away for 17 years. And so, you know, pre iPhone, pre all of this stuff. Right. So he looks around in the coffee shop and he's like, Holy crap. You're right. Everybody's just like, you know, stuck in these phones. So it really has transitioned our lives in a lot of ways. Um, sometimes yes, having access to that data, you know, is, is a good thing, but 
I think behaviorally is where the problem comes in. And Sean, you hit the nail right on the head earlier when you said it's an addiction. It really is an addiction. And that's what we have to be careful with as we work our way through it. Now, let's, I want to transition a little bit now because we've talked a lot about youth and how that impacts us. As we get older in life, especially those teen years and you roll to college and now you got to go get a job, um, from a loneliness standpoint, how can we start to undo and unravel what's already been done, right? Because they've lived that way for 16 years, 18 years, or whatever it might be, and then to college and then so forth and so on. Hopefully in college, maybe they establish some better bonds and some better relationships, or maybe not. And I know, Erica, you do a lot of work with um, some sororities and different things like that. What have you seen as a trend for, and, and obviously us as a, at an older age might be a little bit different, but what are you seeing with the younger college age kids as they're working their way through the sorority? Are they getting, coming out of that with, you know, some of those lifetime bonds that you're seeing? Or is there still some disconnect as they come out of the other side of that? Well, they, they're able to have those lifetime bonds and they're going through different experiences together in, in phases. And of course, you have different people with different personalities that mesh better than with the others. But they're still able to form those lifetime bonds because they have something um, similar, something that they're familiar with, a, a foundation of values. And I think when you come together and you're around people that believe in some of the basic things uh, that you believe, you have at least something to build from. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think that having a group in which you have that basic foundation helps a lot. And they do. They are building um, lifetime relationships. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't drift off. But one of the things that a lot of people that I'm talking to, I've been talking to recently, a lot of us have been saying is we have to make more of an effort because it doesn't happen on its own. You really have to make the plans to do that. Make the plans to check in with a few friends on a Sunday. Call them. Um, make make plans to maybe meet up with a few of them once a month. You have to make a conscious effort to do it. Because if you don't, then you're just going to go about adulting. And then you're going to look up and you'll be thinking, well, all I do is really spend time with my kids. Um, now the kids are gone and I go to work. I may spend time with my spouse, but I really don't do anything outside of that for myself. So as adults, we have to make sure that we are planning that out. Otherwise, we just get busy adulting. And then the next thing you know, you know, life has just passed us by. So first, I'm just going to challenge Erica's uh, sorority statement there. We had a, the big news uh, in, in that space this year was a young lady that uh, pledged an organization and renounced <laughs> her letters the the following day. You know, I was a, a member for 24 hours. So I'm like, and every hundreds of thousands of, of us just <gasps> grasp our pearls at the same time. Like, what happened? What is the mental breakdown that you went through this process that Erica alluded to that should have made these lifelong bonds that lasted 24, 24. hours? Um, there's there's a significant disconnect there. Um, what we're seeing now is it's, it's hard for people to connect person to person because not only, you know, the barriers are th that, that are there are just I immense because you're not, you know, connecting with that person. You're connecting with that, per that, with that person plus, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to first have to get through because like you said, Brian, everyone's already on their phone. So the, uh, excuse me, I want to make friends, but you got to get someone that has their phone down first, and mm. number one. And number two, you know, that phone is a constant baggage of thousands of people that that person is connected to that you're trying to inter interact with. You think you're interacting one-on-one, -on -one, you're interacting one to a thousand or whatever, you know, group that that person is assimilated to because that's how far we've been removed from ourselves, that we don't identify with ourselves. We identify with the interactions and the the groups that, that we that we are that we are a part of um so that makes a big difference you know when we used to be able to go back go across the street and hey you want to go ride bikes well sure you know you could kids do not go and say hey can johnny come out to play anymore mm -hmm. that that is not how that works anymore i, I watch the kids in my neighborhood 
for, they're, they're texting, they're calling. They will. They're not knocking on the door, you know. Yeah, so that's no, it's funny happening. you bring that up. Yeah, I see kids now. They're sitting on the same couch and they text each other. It's like, are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Yes. So that's what you're you, getting. another example of that. We're talking about the family unit and how I was just at a nice beach bar because uh, I just came back from a business trip and I'm sitting there. The, the sun is setting. Blah blah blah. And mm-hmm. it's a family of four, uh, obviously on vacation. Two teenage-ish kids, maybe 12 to 15 years old, a daughter and a son, mom and dad, and they're sitting at a table, and all four are on their phones. So I go, okay, maybe they're looking up something. So I just observed, and, you know, 10 minutes went by, 15 minutes went by, 20 minutes went by, right? And no one looked up, no one exchanged any communication, no one exchanged any words at all in their own zones on their phone in this beautiful moment in this beautiful setting, you know, so no, so that to me always makes me scratch my head and goes back to what Sean is saying back in our time, you go out and you, Hey, you can't try to come out and play, you know, you, you are seeking that type of interaction. Whereas now it's like, there's a force field and and, and it's caused by this thing that's in the palm of your hand. And and how I want to transition with that is this, because it, it, from a professional standpoint, I'm really seeing this as a trend, and this concerns me a lot. Um, I am noticing that now there is a trend that people are even now pushing as hard as they can against having to come to meetings, like mm-hmm. face-to-face come mm-hmm. to meetings, right? And he's like, whoa, what's, what's driving that? And again, it is yeah. they are so disconnected that they don't even want that interaction but they have to sit around a table with six other people for a half hour, an hour, whatever it might be, and actually have to interact. It's like, well, can we just do this through Zoom where we don't have to actually get together? Or can we just create an email that gets the message out versus that actual human interaction? Uh, Have you guys experienced that? And and if so, what what do you think we can do to start to break some of those walls down? Because I see that as being a a major problem for not us, not only us as individuals, but for the success of business as we move forward, because we're losing so much in that space. I, I love the I love the tra- I love the transition um, there, Brian, from children to the, the the professional space, because that is what we see. Most of my meetings are on Teams or Zoom, and when you want to have an in person, it's like, ooh, ah, t- t- do, do we have to? And if you're on Teams or on Zoom. Do I have to turn my camera on? Camera. Yeah. And it's because we've lost our value. Again, it's a values thing. You know, when we're talking about communication, there's different types of communication, right? You have verbal and nonverbal. Which one speaks the most? Mm-hmm. Nonverbal. Nonverbal comes off in person. It's person to person. How you move, how your body reacts. Did mm-hmm. her eye just twitch? Did she smile? Like mm-hmm. all of those things feed into and that is what gives human interaction its depth or the inter- that part of it it's not the words coming out of your mouth it's the, the the interplay between the words that are coming out of your mouth how your mind and body receive it and it's it's a it's a volley back and forth you know between all of, all of that that's interacting the space between people as they're as they're talking you know you know, for my married folks out there, you know when something inappropriate is going on. Why? Because the space, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's not just a friend. That's a little something else. And your spidey sense starts tingling. So that's it's it, that important because you can pick it up from a mile away. But when you don't have that interaction in work, it, it your project effectiveness can take a significant dive uh, if you're not getting people around the table because um, if you listen to Simon Sinek, he talks about, you know, the difference between Apple and, you know, these other companies is about that why, you know, that why comes off in person to person communication. And we've lost that because we forgot that when I was going to knock on Johnny's door, it wasn't what I was getting from Johnny. It was also what Johnny was getting from me. Because when I play, I have a really good time. And he knows that when he plays with Sean, he's going to have a really good time. I know when I play with him, we're going to have a really good time. Because that's why I'm knocking on his door. So we've lost that portion. And we have to get it back. We are professional people 
around the table here for a reason, not just because what our resume says, because our resume says that whatever we're doing with all of our interaction has mm -hmm. created these successes, not the, the words on the page that created those successes. So mm -hmm. it's not the words, it's the interaction. So we have to get back to that, but we have to treasure those interactions. Into treasure interactions, we have to treasure self. Yeah, I was just thinking about the going to the neighbor and knocking on the door um, and what that did for the community, because it gave parents an opportunity to get to know the children as well that their kids are playing with instead of, you know, your kid just runs out and meets up occasionally or, or is always on a video game um, in your house and then the other child's on the, in their house, his or her house, and you never really get to know who your children are friends with unless you take out that time as a community to get to know one another. Um, Y'all, we're talking earlier about the family, um, being at a table and everybody's on the phone. And, um, you know, I would suggest for those that have, I guess, a regular old nuclear uh, family that, you know, if there's a dad there or husband there at the table, that maybe everybody gets a buy-in, the adults get a buy-in that, okay, we're going to have this amount of time and we're all not get, we're going to have our phones down. We're not going to bring our phones, you know, pull our phones out. And if the adults can get on the same page and then they can model that for the children, that at least for this hour, for this dinner, this breakfast, this lunch, whatever you all decided to be, that, you know, we're going to be all into each other. Um, and, you know, we talk about men as leaders. That's one way to start it off uh, is that the man is really going to have to take the lead on that. And, you know, if, unless he's a single parent, if he does have his wife there, you know, really have that conversation with her that, hey, this is the best thing for our family. I want you to go and buy in because this is what I'm going to do in front of the kids. And I don't want you to seem shocked when this happens. <laughs> you know, we're going to go in there unified together. And I think the men are going to really, y'all are going to have to take the lead in that. And for those households in which there's not a man that's um, the head of that household, then, you know, mom, you have to take that lead. And um, yeah, I agree with you. And what, what's important with that, though, from uh, as a man and as a leader and, you know, stepping up to that role, when we say, OK, this is our time to put those phones down, that doesn't then give us the right as a man to then turn around and turn on Sports Center. Because that is the exact same thing, right? So, it, that, so we have to be, we have to own up to that same standard, whatever that means. Because it, what it is, because it, it's not about the device as much as it's about the attention. Where is your focus? Where is your attention at that point in time? And if all you're going to do is just take your attention from the phone to Sports Center on TV, then you've defeated the purpose, right? And you, you, you just spin in your wheels. So that's the commitment piece of the, yeah, as you said, man, as, as a leader of the household, when we essentially set that rule and get that agreement with everyone, that we also honor that same agreement. We, we, we have to be the driver and we also have to be a passenger as far as that goes in, in that scenario. Yeah. I think so it's I agree a with of uh, teaching our children and uh, reminding adults, reminding each other that when we're at the table, when we're doing something, you have to bring something to the table. You can't just sit there and be uninteresting. You have to, you know, we have to communicate. We want to, you know, you know, at, go around the table. Everybody pitch in and be, you know, entertain, entertaining. We teach our children how to be sociable. They, they're going to mimic, they're going to imitate us, right? So, and that includes, you know, as a man, you know, if you're wife is there be interesting like you did when you were trying to uh, make her interested in you same way with the woman be interesting you know to your husband when you're all at the table or, or wherever be interesting don't just be like oh you know i'm about tired of her i'm about tired of him you know <laughs> at least model it and model being sociable in your own household in front of your children so your kids can learn you know oh this is the way that people interact with one another. You know, I, I think there was a, um, Nikki Giovanni was once talking to James Baldwin and uh, she's mentioned, you know, well, you know, if if you love me, then yeah, sure, you lie to me. And he's like, mm -hmm. well, why do you say that? And she was like, well, you know, you go to work every day, you lie, you know, in front of these, lie to these other people and you smile and grin in his face and then you come home to me and you, I get the worst of you. 
I think mm-hmm. when we get together in uh, in our homes, when we get together with our loved ones, we can we can model sociability. We can model kindness. We can model being interesting and being interested um, in the other people in in the room. You have to. It goes back to my, my point earlier about import. You know, Brian's talking about dad turning and turning to a sports center. What did that just tell mom and the kids? You're not important. important. LeBron's important. My Lakers are important. Not not you guys. I mean, you're, you're here, so it's okay, and we're together. But no, you just told me that it's not important. And that's what we're telling each other um, and what society is telling us when we're in the phone is that the people around you are not as important as what I'm giving you, right? As I talked about addiction, like we're addicted to that phone because we've been taught that the phone is the most important thing and we can't be anywhere without it. A great rule is between, you know, what four to seven or whatever your your after, you know, evening routine is for your family is that's a phone free time. So that your family understands that no, I am purposely turning away from all things, putting all of my attention here because you're important to me. We can't assume importance because that's what's feeding this loneliness epidemic because they're realizing that it was all a lie. You you told me I was important, but my subconscious was picking up this whole time that I'm not very important. What's more important is the stories, the show, you know, and, and the cell phone, because my my grandmother, great grandmother, you know, would tell you family's important, but not between eight and ten. OK, because nine o'clock is Price is Right, 830 for <laughs> Nanta, 8, 8 o'clock, you, you know, and you just didn't talk to them during that period. Yeah, but outside of that, you got 100 percent. Now we've got to the converse now where wh- mm-hmm. I guess I'll find some time for you guys today. In, in the midst of all my, you know, 24 hour news loop, 24 hour sports, 24 hour reruns of the Cosby show, 24, you know, <laughs> all of that. So we've got to get back to that point. You know, again, that's that, that reconnection, that reconnection piece. We talked about ways to reconnect, ways to do that is to define what's important in your life. Mm-hmm. You, you're feeling alone because you have lost your way. You don't know what's important. Everything's a sliding scale. You can get canceled tomorrow because you can't cancel me. I can't cancel myself because I'm here. I'm me. But so I don't worry about anything extrinsic because I'm the important. I am the valuable piece for because I woke up this morning and am breathing and animated. I am the most important thing in my day and in my life. And we have to get back to that because without that, we're just floating and waiting for something to latch on to to say, oh, yes, you're important. Why? Because mommy and daddy didn't tell us I was important because he felt that sports center was most important the whole time I was growing up. So all of my formidable years, my subconscious was getting fed. Sean, you're not important. You're not important. You're not important. We can change that. We don't have to wait for someone to change it for us. We have that power. Yes, we do. Yeah. It was interesting. You talked about the phone and, and I don't know how we talk. We spend a lot of time talking about that. But a lot of people feel like, you know, if they leave their phone at home accidentally, it's like, oh, God, I left a child. I mean, it's literally they're, they're, they have this anxiety that comes over them. Um, but, I, but you have to look back to well, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 50s, whatever decade you want to go back to. We didn't have those devices and people got along just fine. And mm-hmm. the excuse that everybody uses, well, what if something happens? I have my phone, right? I mean, that's that's the go-to thing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, well, you know, 1966, if something happened, you had to go find a pay phone or ask, right. oh, God forbid, ask another human being for help. <gasps> right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. so, right? So that's the crazy part about it is we've created this barrier for ourselves, which is, you know, what if something happens? And then, of course, you know what happens when something happens, right? We just pull the phone out and we video it. We don't actually do anything about the thing that's happening. We just video it because we can get likes and views. I mean, that's, yeah. that's our validation point. So it's just interesting. The whole, I think, is it's just so disconnected. Not just, and as Sean, you kept saying it over and over, it's here. It's not out there. 
it's you got to get back to what's going on within you and, and, and what you value. And then that in, in itself, I think, will start to allow you to reconnect with those around you in your community and, and that piece of it. So that's what we need to get focused to. I want to add one more thing on this because I made a note here and I, I want to come back to it because the other thing that seems to have gotten lost and, and I think it's a, the most valuable thing and it ties back to also what you just said, Sean, and that is feelings. There used to be a time where it was okay to ask and or talk about how you feel, what are you feeling, what would you really think? It was valued to do that. Mm-hmm. And to in today's world, somehow it became taboo. I don't know, you know, if you're in a meeting, you know, you, you don't, feelings don't play into it anymore, mm-hmm. right? You, you're not supposed to, you know, voice that in, in those scenarios. And then some of that has even started to boil down into that family unit where I feel a certain way about a certain thing. However, I can't express my feeling right and again that that's you're literally amputating your own soul when you do that because you're choosing to disconnect self from your feelings right and not and not, and not put that out there so erica i'll come to you first to have you share and then john i know you definitely have some, some comments about that piece of it i think people feel that nobody a lot of people uh, feel that no one is interested in how they feel or interested in them. And it might be a reflection of how we all react and act in public. Like you said, all the distractions that we surround ourselves with. Um, I represent a lot of a lot of guys. Um, and about 75% are guys. And one of the reoccurring themes, and regardless of age, regardless of color, you know, regardless of what country they were born in, is they don't feel that anybody cares about them. That's the reoccurring thing, that they are there to give, to work, to, you know, be there, but that nobody really um, cares about them. And maybe the only person that really cared about their feelings uh, was their mother, then their father, and then maybe if they have a sister that they were close to, you know, they may have six sisters, but there might be one sister that they were closer to. Um, but that's it. But that that's really a, a reoccurring theme. So why people don't talk about it, I think for a lot of people, maybe once they tried or twice they tried, but the reaction that they received at some point in their life to, uh, told them that nobody really cares so you might as well just hold it in. And so, and sometimes it's true. Sometimes yeah. people can be that selfish that they don't realize that the person that they're dealing with also has feelings. And so it just becomes a, um, they, it just, uh, they just clash where one person feels that they're not understood or cared for. Another person feels that same way. And then, you know, we have people out here in the world that are just manipulative. And they um, will treat someone like that, just playing off of whatever traumas that other person has. That's why we have to, teaching our kids self-worth and that they're valuable is very important because there are, there are predators that that's what they're seeking. Yeah. Yeah. Hard that's a big thing that I, I talk about a lot when I'm, you know, trying to help coach someone through something is you are entitled to your feelings. There's nothing wrong with how you feel or why you feel a certain way that you, that, that is you, that is what makes you the unique individual that you are is those particular feelings and and, and all of that. So don't suppress it. Don't ignore it. Don't do any of that type. You, you need to try to be better with yourself about going straight at it versus the opposite, which is running away or burying it because all that does is build up inside and that leads to the other things that we talk about, what we really haven't talked about today, but uh, suicide rates and drug use and, and, and just other bad habits that you get into to try to soothe self versus dealing with what really is going on. That's the feelings and the emotional ties that you have. Yes, definitely, definitely. So 
Um, there's no crying in baseball, right? <laughs> we, we, we've heard that, you know, kids are supposed to be seen and not heard. And, you know, and if your feelings are all these types of things. So our society has told us that uh, feeling that feelings don't matter. Feelings don't matter. But, you know, um, I was listening to, um, I don't remember what the author is, but he's telling a story about um, a young man that he met uh, while he's traveling. Um, he was at the Four Seasons Hotel. I think the guy may have been a barista, I, I believe. Um, and the guy was just energized, energetic, and just clearly really loved loved his job. Um, the guy asked him, you know, why he was just going above and beyond with everything that he did. And he said, you know, working at the Four Seasons, I really feel that they care about me. Every manager here comes and asks me how I'm doing. Is there anything that I can do for you? Do you need help with anything? Not not his manager, anybody, anybody in charge. Yeah, just randomly going around and asking how they can make this guy, you know, more successful in his job. You know, um, his, he had another job at a coffee shop somewhere else. And it was quite the opposite. Mm-hmm. He said he, he just worked there to get money and, you know, put his head down and just work, not, not doing any extras and things like that. And the why they didn't care about his feelings. He was just a, a cog in the machine. You clock in, clock out, do your job. Don't get written up and you keep your head down and you just, and you just maneuver through. So in the professional space, the way you show people and how you honor their feelings is directly tied to job satisfaction. You know, and the biggest thing is we as people misunderstand feelings. We don't understand feelings. Our emotions, right? You know, our energy, our energy and motion, that's the swirling beautifulness about us. And that is the the real main thing that separates us from each other Mm -hmm. is is that part, is is the feelings. So when someone asks you what's going on in your world, you're really describing how you feel about what's going on in your world. So feelings are very important. So we've got to pull that back and say, hey, I do care about your feelings because that's what makes you your unique self. And so instead of having you fight against yourself, well, I don't I can't be my true self because no one cares about my feelings. So I'm masking my emotions. I'm masking when I'm sad. I'm masking when I'm happy. Can't be too happy. You know, (laughs) I've got I've got to mute that down to fit into whatever corporate structure or whatever uh, your office dynamic is. Because we've been taught that the feelings of the office, the the setting matters more than the individuals that that are in them. The individuals that are in that organization make the organization. So their feelings create what's called your organizational uh, culture, if you will. So we have to pull that back and understand that the feelings of our organization matters. Organizations like Google that understand have a slide in there and all this all this fun stuff and they really change how we look at work because they really understand that the feelings and the mental space of their employees is what makes them who they are and the better you can manage that the better you are as a company as an individual the more you understand your feelings the better you are at managing the company the corporation called sean and how it interacts as well mm-hmm. One hundred percent. I love that the corporation of Sean, and that's true because that's the thing where I think we get disconnected from is, like you said, I am the job, I am the company. It's the people that make the organization run. So it is we are of value, and we our feelings are all part of that. But that's also where the creativity comes from, and that's why companies like the Googles and the Apples who have these more open type uh, campuses, you know, and you work when you want to work and you you don't work Mm -hmm. from home and they're a lot more flexible because they understand or are trying to give you an arena for the holistic person, right? Mm -hmm. What you need to do to take care of your kids, what you need to do to take care of your spouse, your family, what you need to do to take care of the business itself. And what they have found with opening things up like that is people are actually more productive 
way more creative. I mean, the the mind is allowed to run free when you do that because you're not putting the, these constraints on it, right? So that's why the technologies that they come up with sometimes are just like, how did you think of that? I don't know. I was sitting on the mm-hmm. beach and <laughs> lightning bolt, you know? But allowing me to work from the beach is where the idea came from, right? This is the whole concept behind it. But feelings matter. Feelings are important. And I think the most important thing, especially for men, is we have been told, you know, boys don't cry, blah, blah, blah. You, you, know, you can't wear your feelings on your sleeve and, and all these different things. And now we get to a point where it's like, well, you're not allowed to have them. It's like, well, wait, time out. Hold on. Right. Because I'm human, too. I, I am a male, but I'm, I'm a male human. And humans have feelings. We have emotions. And all of that's relevant to our wellness and our well-being, right? We've got to maintain some type of relationship because if you don't, everything's out of balance. Nothing is in alignment. And that's, I think, a key component. And that drives us back to what we talked about with this loneliness thing, which is where we started this. If I'm out of sync with self, how in the world can I be in sync with the rest of the world? Right? It, it, it's not possible. You know, so as Sean was saying earlier, it starts with you getting those internal conversations all squared away so that you have more balance and you're able to relate. Uh, That said, I want to kind of come to final thoughts. Uh, And Eric, I'll come to you first and just have you share something that you would want our audience to take away today to help continue to build that bridge of connective tissue to other people, other places, other things in the world so that we feel more connected and less lonely. What what would you share? One of the first things I would share is to take that time out to spend time with yourself. Spend some time uh, disconnecting with everything and everyone to really hone in with yourself and to really find out, you know, what you, what I feel about things without being um, told how to feel about things or told how to feel about myself, or how to feel about other situations, to really take that time and disconnect. And then doing that, I think we can start to find a lot of the joy again in life because we're going to be thinking about really how we feel from our own uh, standpoint, our own viewpoint, rather than what everything else is telling us about how we should feel or how we should be. Um, secondly, when it comes to going back out of the, out in the world and deciding with whom we want to associate, uh, take the time out to get to know those individuals. And before you just bring someone into your family circle or friendship circle or find out why they want to be there and really assess if they really have those values that you have. And if they want to be there for the right reasons or if they want to be there just to be seen or for what they can get out of it, see if they really are in alignment with what you believe and what you want to do with your life. And don't, life is short. Don't waste time. Don't waste time. If it's not what you're trying to do, what you're trying to be, who you're becoming, don't waste time with it. Because all of us only have a certain amount of time to get done what we need to get done and enjoy what God meant for us to enjoy. Well, I think as a whole, most people are wasting a lot of time. Very well said. So true. And that foundation of values, and you mentioned that earlier, I think is a key piece to take the time to vet and work your way through with with connections and relationships, because that's going to help both of you stay grounded. It's going to nurture the relationship. It's going to allow you to be more free, more open with your feelings and with your emotions, because you understand each other at that level of what's important and what we both value. You know, your question really said it all. We're we're asking, you know, how to connect and, and how to, and how to surround ourselves, you know, and understanding our feelings because connection is a feeling. It's a feeling you feel connected that's it so the feeling is what matters you know we we talk you know before you know i love neville 
Neville mm-hmm. Goddard and his feeling the feeling your way into manifesting and you know living in the end. And, but the, the the key point is feeling. The the feeling is that but what we need to do, and this is my, what I'd close with is we need to manage our feelings better. That's the thing that we're missing. That's the missing piece in the equation. Don't say don't wear your your feelings on your sleeve. Don't you know not feel. Don't drink your feelings away. Numb yourself to society because your the issue that you're having is not the feeling. The issue that you're having is how to manage those feelings because you were told that feelings didn't matter. So therefore, you weren't told how to manage them. So many people have issues with money because they were told they didn't have money, one, or if they didn't have money, because they didn't have money, they weren't also told how to manage money. You can't manage what you don't have. Hey, let's balance a bank book. Oh, um, what, what, what am I balancing again? <laughs> you know, balancing these food stamps. What, what are we doing here? Right. So, you know, it's the same thing with our feelings. If you're not taught to value your feelings, you're not taught how to properly manage your feelings. I have a background in HR and feelings matter when, you know, when you're talking about, um, the ongoings that happen on the job, sexual harassments and things of that nature, um, perceptions, reality and things like that. I didn't say anything to that lady. Well, she felt Mm -hmm. that you blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So the feeling is what matters. We need to learn how to better manage our feelings by understanding ourselves. If we understand ourselves, we can understand what matters in our life. We can also not connect too strongly to our feelings as well that lead to depression and understand that there is a level of disconnect between feelings that's there be a boundary between you and that feeling so it can swirl right around you you don't have to be angry you don't have to feel these pressures that you're feeling because they're not happening to you you are just your feeling is you acknowledging these things so we can also better understand that as well so understand that hey wow that they said something to me and I felt mm-hmm. blah. Now I don't have to go off and tell them, you know, my mind because, Hey, that was just a feeling. Okay. Is that feeling valid? Number one. And then should I act on that feeling? If you take that, that, that degree of separation between you and that feeling, now we're managing our feeling. Okay. That, that, I may have overreacted so I can catch myself from having to go back and apologize for something later, you know, because that was an overreaction. I, now that I think about it, it really wasn't that me really wasn't that big of a deal. It was me. What in my feelings, (laughs) we use that a lot. You know, I had gotten my feelings about this thing. So get out of our feelings, understand how to manage our feelings while still feeling a hundred percent, everything that's going on, not numbing them out with drugs and alcohol, uh, binge watching TV and all these other distractions. Take time in your day to sit with yourself in self-dialogue, self-reflection, understand who you are, value yourself and understand the feelings that you're feeling that are individual to you. They're yours. You get to cultivate that in your own garden and then you are your best self going forward and now you're presenting yourself as the best friend the best spouse the best co-worker the best boss the best of yourself the best you can be when you're in control of those things around you but again i always say we start small start at home start simple i want to pick up right where you left off sean because that's perfect and thank you for the segue um because that is, that is the important piece is that internal work first, but then all of us as adults, well, what are, and I'll use that term very broadly, mm-hmm. uh, that are in a leadership position. And again, when I say leadership, that could be everything from, yes, you're the boss to I'm dad or mom at home, that, that you are in a leadership role when you're in those places and in those spaces. Uh, mm-hmm. So just understanding that, yeah, first you've got to sort a lot of that out for self and get get a solid foundation there 
now I'm talking generationally, how do we continue to kind of break this cycle? Because that's where we are now. We, we, we literally are so far mm-hmm. down the road that we need to kind of have an intervention, if you want to use that term. So those of us that are leaders of our family, of our workspace, whatever it might be, um, need to start to, after we've gotten ourselves squared away, then take charge of those arenas by having boundaries, setting boundaries, letting everybody know that it's okay to be more self-expressive, bring those things to the table. We are going to have a face-to-face meeting once a week. Everybody will be, is required to participate, right? You know, just because how else do we start to break down these walls unless we set an expectation and change the behaviors, right? So those are the, that would be the thing that I would start to advise is, to start to, as the old term about pay it forward, which is really mean going back, right? We've got to start to break the trend and the cycle and bring back those things that give us that feeling of connection. Uh, and that's at whatever level and in whatever spaces we normally operate within our world today. Right? So I think that's a key component. So until next time, I want to thank everyone. Thank you guys for all of your input. And as I always say, take care and definitely take care of each other. We'll see you soon. Bye now. Thanks, Brian. Bye-bye.